Hi, and welcome back. Um, I'm Rasheen McKenzie. I'm the Chief People Officer at Saga PLC. Um, I'm joined today by some fantastic guests. So welcome all, and we'll get on to some intros shortly. And we are your final panel of today. Um, and I've got the privilege of exploring a topic close to my heart, um, having given birth to my lovely daughter nine months ago. And um, so we're going to be exploring kind of creating family friendly workplaces, fertility and parental matters. And I'm sure we may go off piece, but but we're going to try our best. Um, it's clear that organisations are, you know, grappling with this um, topic and rightly so, because it's an important one. You know, parenthood can be one of the most exciting times of our life, having just done it myself, but it's not always easy um, for employees to, to get to that point. And what we want to talk about today is really that that route and those alternative routes um, to getting to, to parenthood and the impact that has on ourselves, our mental health, um, and also what our employers can be doing to, to support us. Um, and as we delve into these topics, you know, we will look at kind of the broad family for, uh, family friendly policies, how organisations are truly stepping up in that space um, and also how we can explore those different routes to parenthood um, as well as the impact that that has. So whether that's thinking about kind of IVF or surrogacy or adoption leave. Um, and I can't wait to hear from our guest speakers today on these topics. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'm conscious of time because I'm sure we will take up up the 45 minutes is I'd love um, for each of you to kind of introduce yourself a bit about you and your role um, and also why uh, d &I is so important to, to you. Um, so I'm going to come to Zara first, if that's OK. Hi, thank you. I'm quite excited for this topic for the final panel today. Uh, so uh, my name is Zara and I'm the European Talent Director for Odeon Cinemas Group and I lead um, our talent and inclusion strategy for the group. Um, and I'm also the People Director for the UKI. Uh, so I get loads of breath to what I get to get excited by. Um, and I'm also a mom of two. Um, so have all of what comes with that as well. Awesome. And Stacey? Hi, everybody. I'm Stacey Ram. Um, I am the I am a head of D&I and Wellbeing. Um, I've worked across D&I and Wellbeing for a number of years for some large organisations that you might recognise. Um, a couple of household names across Virgin Media and Every. Um, so I'm really excited also to get into this discussion, um, having had first hand experience of going through fertility treatment um, and shaping organisational policies around family friendly um, and parental leave policies too. Thank you, Stacey. And Dishon, coming over to you. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Deshaun Wise-Porter. I'm the Global Head of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Recognition at Hilton, um, supporting all of our lines of business on a global scale. I am a mother of two, a proud mother of two boys, uh, two and a half and one. So I am in the early stages and the thick of it. I'm also the author of a book called Faith, Fertility and uh, Faith Friendship and Fertility, uh, basically dictating my journey um, to, to motherhood. I am so excited to get into, <laughs> into this panel with the three of you. I think outside of this, I, I might hit you up for some parenting advice as well, being kind of nine months in. And I think we should all pat ourselves on the back for, for getting here and, and looking so glam today. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to kick off um, by kind of starting the discussion with some questions um, and first to Deshaun, if that's OK, um, if I could come to you first. So, you know, what are some of the main facilities challenges that employees face um, when trying to conceive and how does this impact in the workplace? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a, a great question. I think it's important for us to just start with some statistics. And um, it, it's important to understand and recognize that one in six couples on a global scale seek treatment for fertility. And that it's inclusive of both men and women. And so in understanding that, and then you think about your particular workforce and you just count around and you say one in six, wow, there's seven people in this room. That means one of us is facing that. It just really makes it real for you. When you talk about the challenges that one faces, 
it's directly correlated to how long it takes them to achieve the goal. However, across the board, the common challenges are four of them. Key, there's four key ones, emotional, physical, social and performance, and then financial. And I can just pause on them. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but emotionally, it's emotionally charging time. When individuals are wanting to have a family, start their family, and they're experiencing delays, and a lot of times it is unexplained infertility. And so that makes it even more challenging from an emotional perspective. You're like, I did everything right. I'm a healthy person. I, you know, and you can't, you can't accomplish it. So the emotional side can be very heavy. On the physical side, there's medications, there's the administration of those medications, there's timed medications. It's getting to and from those appointments, which can be very challenging. And when they tell you that your appointment's at 7 a.m., they've got to draw your blood at 7 a.m. And so it's it's that can be incredibly taxing on, on both parties, right? There's also the social and performance piece. It's are you going to feel like yourself? Are you, are you, do you carry any shame in terms of being present? When people start asking you, hey, do you have any kids? Or are you, or when are you going to have kids? You know, all of those questions can um, really draw back to the emotional segment and be incredibly difficult. But in addition to that, sometimes the medications that you're taking can also make you feel outside of yourself. And with that, it has an impact on your performance. When you think about not just how you're showing up at home, but also how are you showing up throughout those days in the meeting, particularly if you have to take medications in the middle of your workday and the impact that that has. And then, of course, one thing that I think everybody keeps on the top of their mind is the financial component, right? It can be incredibly expensive and there's a lot of benefit to individuals that are going through this when they know that, listen, my company provides this particular resource for me. Whether it's the time off or whether it's um, flexible scheduling to be able to get in and out of those doctor's appointments and or benefits that help you pay for those beds and pay for your appointment. So it, it can it can range definitely for everyone, but I think it's important that companies really spend some time thinking about as we are developing a portfolio and a suite of offerings in terms of benefits, are we ensuring that we're providing benefits that are applicable to individuals at every point of their particular life cycle? Yep. And fertility yep. benefits has become one. We are seeing more and more individuals at younger ages experience this. And so we need to make sure that, you know, to the extent companies can lean in and identify how do you provide that support beyond just the actual health benefit of it, but also thinking about the mental side of it, any physical training so people can continue to stay in shape and give their give them their self and their mind an opportunity to not think about that for a moment and focus on another component. And then above all, I would say a company cannot forget how important it is to make sure that you're training your leadership to be supportive as well. Because that's a component. It's easy to put the benefit in place. I know there's a cost to that, but you have to make sure that your leadership, all of your managers and the whole team um, is able to be supportive indiv of individuals during during the time as well. Yeah, and I think you're, you're spot on. I think two things that have just resonated there that you know I'd, I'd love to get the views from the panelists on is, is absolutely that one in six. You know, it's we talk about, yep, yeah, you know, organizations are thinking about this. Well, it's not just, you know, it's not just about thinking, it's acting. And then it's actually following up, as you say, with that kind of that deep education, because, you know, this is, it can be an incredibly in exciting journey for, for some couples, but or for some individuals rather. But, but as you said, it can be really emotionally draining. And those individuals are expected to show up as normal and perform as normal and probably this isn't you know this isn't talked about so you know i'd love stacy and zara to kind of come in and, and what you've heard from from deshaun yeah i think oh, oh sorry zara <laughs> i i think it was a really interesting the points that you've made deshaun and obviously i can share from both a professional and a personal experience aspect so i i went through fertility treatment and went through ivf with my husband um 
back in 2021 in the midst of a pandemic. So, um, you know, I think that was a challenging time as it was. Um, but I think it's it's really vital that organisations step up to support people in this space. And and for me personally, you know, I remember you know just touching on a few points that you've just mentioned there, sitting on calls where I just had brain fog and I was I was sat there thinking. I don't actually know what I'm here to talk about. I'd completely forgotten. Um, and also remember being sat on a, a call with my team at the time and just bursting into tears. And I'm not an emotional person at all. Um, so for me, that was as much of a shock for me as it was for them and trying to process that. But I think the thing that truly helped me wasn't the fact that a company specified fertility treatment or paying for fertility treatment in their policy. It was a workplace environment and it's that support um, and, you know, for me, I think it truly made such a big difference having a, a supportive manager um, who really understood it and, and really just allowed me the space and freedom and flexibility um, without any judgment for, for anything that I was going through. And, and that made the world of difference to me. And I think I think you absolutely have hit the nail on the head there. It's not about what's written in a policy. It's about how how much do your uh, line managers understand and how much are they willing to be able to offer that level of support to people that truly need it? Yeah, I think I think that's one of the big things, even when I was thinking about today that I was reflecting on a lot is just, and we see it in so many areas, right? But that impact of the person you actually talk to, because a lot of the time these can be very private parts of your life um, that you you don't want everyone in the team to know. And, and by person, that's different, of course. And But you, you may not wish to have that as part of the conversation with those you're with working with every day. But if you have that one person who's responding to life um, rather than whatever is in a process, you know, that impact is so powerful. But the challenge with that is obviously how inconsistent that can be and um, how that experience can be so varied and therefore the comfort and the the net of support you need isn't given to you by by nature of who you may be working with or confiding in or, or, or reporting to at the time. So I think that's one of the big challenges around this, particularly to the um, emotional impact that Deshaun was talking through, because that is so by person and um, and you really need skills in your leaders to be able to make sure that they are supporting in the best way possible, but that they're flexing that support. You know, often I find, you know, the want is tell me how to best support this person or where do I go or how, what can we do and what, what's within the possible. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't come around again until there's another conversation, but it's not the same formula. And, and it might need to ebb and flow differently through the stage of support. Um, so yeah, building that, that real life toolkit versus a process policy toolkit, I think it's one of the biggest challenges to help, particularly that emotional piece that Joshua was talking about. Yeah, I agree. It's keeping that the conversations human um i think is so so important um i think what what I, you know what i'm hearing through there is also that kind of openness within the culture and actually people feeling like they can approach their manager and that they, or their leader or you know even a colleague or or you know a, a peer to you know for that support um zara i'm gonna come to you if that's okay next so so how are leading companies providing support, particularly for those, you know, struggling with fertility challenges or ex or exploring alternative routes to parenthood? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a real mix out there in what we're seeing. So there's some companies who are really getting funded on thinking about fertility leave and what that means. And that may mean adaptions to the working day to support much of what Deshaun talked through, or that may mean how leave is supported afterwards. Uh, there's quite a bit out there that has some positive and, and I think a bit of negative rumblings as well around companies who are supporting with egg freezing and supporting colleagues in, in that side. And I find it interesting when you hear um, some the, the good support of that and then also the crits of that, the criticisms that come out. Um, I think one of the big things is just thinking about what family is and the meaning of family and what, uh, you know, there is no standard form of family. And so, you know, do, back to annoyingly, as a starting position, do your policies and processes support 
uh, the chosen family and the way in which people are li living their lives. And, you know, from language to narrative to thinking about adoptive leave in the same way as maternity leave and how that is paid for and how to um, the point around financial concerns, how you can remove some of those concerns and worries for people through your processes, having much more equity to them. So I think the whole meaning of a starting position on what, how people identify family and how you, we are internally set up in organizations to support the breadth of family needs that may exist for our colleagues is such an important starting point because there's intent and there's process and there's obviously costs of things that need to feed in, but as a baseline, do you understand in, in what you're doing as, as an employer, uh, what family can look like and therefore how it may need to be supported? Um, and I think we have a long way to go with that. I think people are moving there kind of, it almost feels like dipping their toes in water <laughs> a little bit. Um, and some of that doesn't have a huge financial attachment to it either. Um, some of that is language and education and support um, rather than you know thinking about it in terms of total total financial, financial impact which often can happen yeah absolutely and you touched on it um as you were talking um and and having experienced it recently the kind of the return to work as as well um i think the the journey to to that parenthood and Kind of how we support that and then and then the return is is an area that i think we probably don't talk about enough as well no. and so i just love to get your your view on that oh return to work i mean i think one of the biggest things is um i think somehow em employers you know not maybe sometimes always thinking these things through assume that a person who's returning to work for the first time that's exactly what they need when they return, how they're going to feel, how they want to phase their week, what extra support. And the reality is you learn as you return, right? You don't know until you start to do it because um, if you haven't done it before, you haven't done it before. And But even if you have, your circumstances will be different. The child is different or your personal um, uh, general circumstances are different. So I think the biggest piece is there's almost this what I think traditionally was a positive effort of how can we support you without the well I don't know <laughs> part and the continuous check-in that follows and um, and then we see loads of things where I think employers make mistakes uh when when people are going through maternity leave returning maternity leave um around assumptions you know so the assumption as to whether you wish to continue progressing your career or not and what you hear about or don't um, the assumption you'll want to phase the assumption you'll want x amount of period of time off work because most people want x amount of period of time off work or yeah you know, there's so many assumptions that happen and then i think quite quickly once someone's back they it's like oh they're back it's forgotten right you're back now you know you've had those first couple of weeks or maybe a month if you're lucky of the unsaid said and then it's you know all of the things you were still learning about returning to work, you're only starting to learn at that point. Um, but the check-in has stopped or changed or evolved. I I remember when I um, returned uh, from from my uh, having had my son, and I had interviewed for um, to become the HR director while I was eight and a half months pregnant. So I I returned starting into that role, which was quite a fun experience. <laughs> um, but the things that I hadn't thought about was I was still feeding him. And so, you know, thinking about where the space was going to be. And I remember having a bit of a code with my um, line manager CEO at the time where I would send her a text and I'd be like, oh, I need to go now because we've hit the point where I need I need to exit and I will return to the board meeting in a few minutes. And like I hadn't thought about any of those things yeah. when I thought about returning. I didn't think to mention any of it. But it was real challenges that that naturally came into the day. So I think the big part for me is back to what we were talking about around, you know, what are your processes? What are your policies? What's your intent versus the reality of what somebody experiences when they return? But also the assumptions that go in, into that and how much waiting we put on those returning to be able to know. Um, I think that needs a bit of support. 
yeah lots of nodding heads i think i think from us um i think i vowed to share my story continuously about returning to work and and i think that's the best option in terms of education you know these things you just to your point zara you just don't think about um and and that's mainly because you've got a million other things that you're you know you're trying to you know manage i think logistics is like at the top of the list for for most parents so um yeah i think what what theme comes through for me is is still that individuality and um, even when you were talking there zara you know that individuality of of how are you having those conversations what you think might change m trying to get out of those assumptions so i don't know deshaun stacy does that resonate with you nodding heads yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Listen, I, th I think it's it's critically important that there when we talk about flexibility in the workplace and we talk about the flexibility of a leader, it's being able to take some foundational knowledge and then adapt it to the actual situation. It's not designed to give anyone a blueprint to say this is how you need to treat each and every person that's in this particular situation. There has to be strong um, judgment as well as individuality in terms of making sure that we're able to support each person is an individual. And so we have to provide them the support that meets their needs at that time. And sometimes it's structural and then other times it's literally just being a good leader and showing up in the way that's necessary. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, kind of from a fertility angle as well, you know, it's it's even just knowing that you've got a team around you that understands your circumstances. So um, I was really open about my experience of going through fertility treatment and largely because I wanted people to understand what challenges that posed for me, uh, you know, as an individual, but also that my circumstances, a little bit like what you were touching on before, Zara, that is not um, a one size fits all. Like just because I was going through uh, IVF doesn't mean to say that the person in the next room going through IVF is going to have the same experience. And, you know, at the drop of the hat, I would be phoned for an appointment and and there was nothing that I could do about that that was just I had to go in at that time of day and um you know the unfortunately um you know when you're kind of working with uh fertility clinics they're not the most flexible and um, so if any of you have had any experience of that you'll know firsthand that you have to come in at that time and usually their time window is on a certain day or certain days of the week between certain hours and, and generally speaking that is between you know 10 and 4 and, and there's nothing really that you can do about that and and unfortunately that that is what it is and and I think that's for me why I chose to take the route of being so open with my company at the time because it allowed me to really talk about it freely, but but also to enable the business to understand actually at scale what that means for people going through different circumstances and and actually what support looks like and and you know as you as you've all touched on the the support is really critical. It's really key to the success of shifting the dial because it isn't just writing in a policy how you're going to do that. It's actually living and breathing it, and it's part and parcel of the culture. And you know if it's all well and good having you know, that staple strap line within, within your policy. Um, but if you're not offering support to somebody that's physically going through that treatment or, you know, coming back to work, as you've said, after, after being off uh, of an extended period of family leave, coming back to work looks and feels very different for, for, uh, for many different people. Um, and so it can't just be this blueprint that organisations follow and it's a tick, uh, you know, tick list and checklist of, all these lists of things to do which I'm sure are great by the way and it's absolutely a starting point but uh, I think companies have to learn to be more adaptable to individual circumstances and individuals people's needs and what you know what their circumstances are at home you know if they're also carers outside of work or they've got yeah. disability or you know a neurodiversity whatever that might look like their individual circumstances are going to be different behind the scenes and I think it's really important that employers show um you know, that they're listening and that they're seeing people for who they are in that kind of whole 360 as opposed to just a one dimensional view. There's one thing I, I'd, I'd want to chime in here on, because this is something that's uh, unintentionally overlooked, but very important. So as you, as one goes through the fertility process, um, sometimes there's successes and then there's sometimes there is um, deep disappointments, right, that essentially um, result in miscarriages. And what we found and when we were doing some of the research is that 
there are particular as you span the globe, there is a highly overlooked component of a miscarriage is a death. And is, is that included within your bereavement policy? Yeah, and particularly if you are the one that's carrying the fetus and you lose that, you lose the baby, um, the three days or the five days that's extended for bereavement might not necessarily be enough. And so I, I think it's definitely important to have the discussion, but as we are kind of like thinking about how do you really show up and how do you make sure that there's programs in which to support, that's a, a, a pretty easy one to take a look at and just do a double click on your bereavement policy as it is today and determine is there room in which to make sure that A, you're highlighting miscarriage very directly so people know and understand um, because then it gives them more of the opportunity in which to talk about their situation, even if they don't want a deep conversation, but it, it enables them to come to the table and say, listen, I've experienced this and I need the time for this. Um, but then it also, of course, just it, it expands, you know, how you're supporting your team member overall. I think, I think that's that, yeah. huge. Can I just build on that, Roisin? Sorry. I think that is such a huge, I'm really glad you called that out because the, you know, loss and the impact of loss, whether it's, you know, the miscarriage and, and, but also sometimes it's the loss of a dream of a want of, and I think that's where also in line with from the bereavement policy, which I completely agree with, it's the emotional additional support that we can give. Um, you know, how, how does, you know, how does an employer step into the space where they are actually supporting someone through that grief, through that, loss of of what they hoped would be um in a really embedded emotional way and with additional tools of support because that is something that's quite difficult within the workplace right and not every no matter how much we empower leaders to be agile and flexible and and everything we want them to be they will not always be nor should they be equipped for all of the real depth of heartbreak that can come from loss and um I, I experienced lots of loss myself on the road to having my two children and I had very mixed line manager responses through it. And and I think really thinking about the, I hate to say to degree outsource, but the additional support we can give people experiencing loss is so incredibly important. Yeah, I think as well, it's that psychological safety element, yes. it, isn't it? It's, yeah. I know we, I know often as DE and i leaders, we talk about that word, but I think that, or that phrase rather, but I think if you don't have psychological safety in your business, for people to even open up that they're experiencing, um, you know, uh, going through fertility treatment in the first place or experiencing loss, um, I think is a, you know, it's a huge dy dynamic in itself. So you've got to have a, you know, a great, well, a, a good level of psychological safety to some extent for people to even feel comfortable and confident enough to open up about what support it is that they need. And then as you say, it's, what steps you can take, or you know, as an employer that go above and beyond um, to to support that colleague whilst they're experiencing that loss or going through that challenging time, and you know that might be internal support, but it also might be external avenues of support as well. And you know, it's it's you recognizing when you need to do more, but also when you need to step back and let an expert kind of step in as well. I think that's um, kind of a. a a great um a great point to be made actually that you don't have to solve everything internally and actually you can utilize as you're building your policies and your benefits and support it is absolutely as you say it's drawing in those experts to make sure you've got that that armor you've got that toolkit for for your colleagues and i think the other point there is that point absolutely um stacy that you said which is you know that colleague could be talking about the loss before they've even talked about starting fertility because it's not always the case that, you know, they're as open because they don't want to be or the culture isn't as open as they'd like to be. Um, so I think uh, excellent, you know, excellent point, I think, for for all of those listening to to really take away as they, they build that armour and build that toolkit. So Stacey, I'm going to come to you to to you next. So kind of listening to today's discussion you know do you think um employers are doing enough to ensure that their policies are truly family friendly um 
I think that that could be a bit of a twofold answer. Um, so kind of looking at from a statistical perspective, research shows that around two fifths of people who are in work across the UK uh, don't feel that their employer is doing enough. Um, so I recently ran a poll on my LinkedIn profile and, and only 20% of people who responded to that said that their workplace was doing enough around fertility support more specifically. Um, but I think that there is very different variations um, of support and de you know various degrees of, of support across businesses, um, particularly across the UK at the moment. Um, and I think that that really does depend on, I guess, how much research an organisation has carried out and, and what investment they've really put in to this from a you know from a, a from a monetary perspective but also from a mechanism perspective internally in, in in their culture what i would say is on the surface level um you know there does seem to be more organizations that are committing to doing more particularly around parental leave and offering a greater level of support what i would say is that tends to be more progressive organizations or your startup organizations um it's not always um kind of the you know your household names always that people are talking about more freely I also think that um how people view that level of support can be very different so some people might might view you know 15 weeks paid leave as excellent whereas others might say well actually my company offers 26 weeks paid leave so I think you know what what good looks like looks very different um but what I would say is there's a lot of companies that do seem to be sitting up and listening and taking note that this is obviously you know, a top priority for many people when they're considering a place of work, you know, particularly for, um, you know, from an attraction and retention of diverse talent perspective. But also we know that it's something that particularly younger generations value when they're sourcing, you know, job positions or looking at alternative jobs. They're actively seeking out what the employee benefits package looks like and, and particularly around family leave or parental leave as such. What I would say is what I've what I've seen in my experience in kind of developing more inclusive workplace policies around parental leave is if your policy only supports or enhances paid leave around maternity or adoption, then I would argue that it's not really inclusive of everybody because what about, you know, the co-parent or paternity leave or, you know, how does that work for many different family structures? Because if you're not talking about that or you're not advancing that, then really it only continues to perpetuate those gender stereotypes because we all know <laughs> that generally speaking it is women who take on the more of the caring role or the parental role and that responsibility often falls to the woman so we know that that will have an impact negative impact on gender pay gap from a gender equity point of view in progressional opportunities career development in a workplace so they're all blockers so I think I guess my advice to any organisation that's considering this is how do you look at that more holistically? It's not just thinking about how do we advance maternity pay or, you know, how do we give a few more weeks adoption leave? It's how do we look at fertility, at, you know, family leave, inclusive of fertility as a whole picture. Um, and that can be any diverse family structure, um, which continues to evolve and shape. It shouldn't just be a um, you know, we've got this policy in place and we'll review it again in five years time. It should be a working document where you're continuously looking at, OK, what does the external market look like and what does competitive look like? Um, because it's, you know, it's not just about ticking a box. It's about real structured support. Um, and then as we've as we've touched on already, I would say that it's, you know, it's about what do, how how inclusive and accessible is that policy and that paid leave to everybody? Is there a you know, time limit where you've got to be employed for 12 months before you can even access that benefit. You know, what, what does that look like really to many fi family structures who might have already been considering or have a time window on going through fertility treatment because of their age, as an example, or looking at adoption or fostering or caring, you know. So I think family structures are very dynamic as a whole and, and kind of a, writing a policy and being progressive in that space can really be tenfold. Um, and there's lots of things to consider um, and then as we've touched on already, it's about the aftercare. It's, you know, after somebody's gone through fertility treatment, after somebody comes back from work, uh, comes back from um, extended leave, what does that support in the workplace look like? Um, it's not a one size fits all. And it's a, for, for me to really say, are, are we being progressive enough? I would argue that in some ways, yes, on the surface level. Um, but when you dig a little deeper, I do think that there's still a huge amount of work to be done. I think what's encouraging is that there's so many organisations that are sitting up and listening 
and are you know seeking out knowledge and experience lived experience of people that have gone through this so they can really truly develop their policies from an equity perspective um, and that's the thing that I would always encourage a business to do because without equity you're kind of just looking at it from a surface level and you've really got to consider family leave and family leave dynamics from a um, holistic view. Yeah I couldn't agree more I think <laughs> I think it's um, so with so many of these you know these topics it, it's there's progress that's been made but it's kind of never finished, right? And I think it's making sure that you're not sat in, in your organisation thinking, oh, great, I'm done. You know, I've tackled that that problem, you know, that facet. It's, it's, it's a continu continuous, continuous improvement or, you know, that external in and making sure that you're, you're really sort of listening and acting um, to, to that colleague base. And I think you touched on it earlier, it's that life cycle. So, you then got to factor in that not everybody is going to be, you know, kind of at this moment in time in their life, but they might be, you know, thinking about a carer's policy and then and then actually, you know, again, it's that when you're looking at this piece, it's got to be holistic. And um, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more, um, Stacey. Uh, Zara, Deshaun, like anything resonate with you there that you'd like to kind of call out? Yeah, I think the holistic is absolutely right. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we see. So I think, to your point, Stacey, I think you can see employers doing more and, and thinking about what they can do and trying to look at, you know, um, different pieces that they can go after. But it is in pieces often, rather than the view that you've just talked through. It's it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's a chip away approach rather than actually where are we going to get to and how do we make sure we're thinking of everything that we need to and how it all feeds in together. Um, I was thinking actually ahead of today that um, it's really, and I think it's still present, but you know, you would be thinking about apply, applying and joining an organization and you you wouldn't want to ask, you know, what is your maternity policy? And this is a basic whatever amount of years ago. You wouldn't want to ask that question because you would be fearful of the trigger that would create and and whether that would, you know, hinder you being considered for something. And and it's almost like we've kind of made some of those moves, but we we haven't actually maintained momentum on the real breadth of where we need to get to. And I think one of the things that's happening culturally in the UK, which I think is great, is that, you know, that the younger colleagues joining the organisations are demanding a bit of a more overt transparency and they're pushing everything on in the right direction by asking the right questions in a lot of spaces. So I think that helps. Um, but it just it really kind of makes you think about, you know, where we've been and how how do you actually get pace behind intent? Uh, and move some of these pieces forward much quicker uh, for people. But I totally agree on the holistic and uh, approach that Stacey talked through and how you look at everything um, together and family, what family is. Yeah. And the component to that that I'll add is just never underestimate the level of engagement that comes alongside the somebody feeling as though they're in an environment that they have psychological safety, as well as that they are supported through every piece of their of their particular life cycle. And so I think I think that's just it's just critically important, particularly when you're talking about wanting to have a top performing company right? You want individuals to be able to bring their best and in which to be able to do that, we have to bring our whole selves to work and we have to realize that sometimes our whole selves is not whole. But how, what benefits are essentially in place as well as how is leadership and the rest of the team um, able to lean in when you know that somebody might be having an off day or an off season, right? Um, it, it's not always end of the road for individuals. I think there's ways that we can essentially support them as as the as lives are changing. Yeah, I think as well. I think as well. Just if I can jump back in on that point, I think it's absolutely crucial. Um, and I, I think you're spot on with that. And I also think that Zara, to your point about um, you know younger generations kind of coming in and demanding more, I do think that that is really the catalyst for, for what's changing people's mindset and views on this. Um, you know, years ago, people wouldn't talk about their families at work. And I do think that the pandemic helped to shift that because, you know, children would be in the background or your dogs would be on your lap or well, whatever that might be. Um, so people started to see people behind the camera as a human, as opposed to just a robot that did a job and came to work and sat on that seat and went home. And, and I do think that that dynamic has shifted. And 
And I do think that younger generations coming through the workplace and demanding more from an employer is really positive because I think it will help to shift the dial. Do I think that it's happening quick enough? In an ideal world, I don't. I think it should happen quicker. And I think that we're much behind the curve in comparison to, you know, other countries in Europe, for example. Um, you know, particularly when you look at things like, you know, some some organisations within their office spaces have breastfeeding rooms or um, you know nursing spaces or they have spaces where people can inject uh, if they're doing hormone injections for fertility treatment you know rather than doing that in the toilet and things like that and you know I think it's just about what you know what that looks like for everybody and I think you know starting from a blank sheet of paper is almost seems like an impossible task right for a lot of employers and um, and I think that's where you know gaining expertise and knowledge from people that have first hand hand experience of um, you know, whatever that might be in terms of their fam- family dynamic, I think is really powerful. And that's where I think organisations can really use their own individual colleagues to ha- ask them firsthand what their experience of family means um, to them and what does their structure look like at home and how can they best support them? Um, you know, I, I, I think I wouldn't um, wish anybody to start from a blank sheet of paper, but ultimately we've all got a great people, a great group of people around us that can really allow us to strive for equity in our family friendly policies. I love that. And I think we should challenge ourselves sometimes with the blank sheet of paper. I think we can get so entrenched in, in kind of where the culture is or kind of the construct around work or working environments. Um, And also, I still think there's a huge amount of stigma around this topic actually within within the workplace. So I think actually, Stacey, there's a beauty in what you're saying with when you're looking at that holistic approach, when you're stepping back and thinking about how does this work within my organisation and how far am I pushing this, the blank sheet of paper might be the place to start and then actually work from there. Um, And I'm super conscious of time, um, but I'd love if I could just give you kind of 30 seconds each really to talk about kind of one thing that's happening within your organisation in this space that you're super proud of. Um, and I'll, I'll come to Deshaun first, if that's OK. Absolutely. Listen, we have a suite of offerings on a global scale. I think what we're trying to do is scale some of these um, benefits across all of our countries um, more succinctly. And so that's that's really been a key. The other element, which is on the softer side of things, less programmatic, is that we've seen more leaders lean in and share their stories. And so I, I commend you all for getting on this call and and sharing a little bit of your story, definitely a thank you to Dial Global for even hosting this very important conversation because the more leadership can show up and talk about their own particular journeys, it just opens the doors for others to be able to say, you know what, this is a safe home for me. This is where I wanna continue to to invest in my career and and, and have a long career journey. And so I think it's, it's critically important and I just, I appreciate the, the conversation, but also the courage that it takes to show your to share your story and allow other people to do the same. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. And Zara? Um, yeah, oh, that, that was so beautifully said. Um, I think I think similar things. We're we're doing a piece of the moment where we've been going out and actually trying to learn from our returners. Um, I think we definitely entered into a space where we thought we had a certain experience and maybe it wasn't quite what we thought it was. Um, It had good intents, but there's things we can improve. So we're in a process on that. We're also in a process and actually pulling all those core policies and looking at how we want to evolve them going forward. Uh, But similarly to Deshaun, leadership has been huge for us in the last year, how people are starting into conversation, people learn. Um, and having curiosity to understand what we don't know. And that's been a real growth area for us and something I think will really help us as we move forward. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And Stacey? Yeah, uh, so I've just actually finished my uh, position with Every, but just before I joined, uh, just before I left, we were in the process of kind of developing more inclusive um, and enhanced family leave policies that kind of encapsulate everything that we've talked about here from a more holistic sort of family structure. Um, but I would uh, echo some of the points already been made. So um, in my previous employment with Virgin Media, we developed um, a returners to work program by using first hand experience of our colleagues that did come back from work 
uh, you know, whether that was, you know, after paternity or maternity or adoption and really kind of utilizing that experience to lean in and develop something that really works for the business and the colleagues that work within it. Um, and I, I would echo the points around leadership. You know, we all know us on this call and, and the people that are listening here that um, utilizing leadership experience firsthand in, in kind of sharing that is hugely powerful to shift in the dialogue, particularly around psychological safety and for something that's deeply personal to so many people when it comes to family and family structures, I think um, will only kind of help to, to shift the dial um, and move up the conversation on. So hopefully, you know, in another year's time or two years time, we'll be sat here and having a, a different conversation about how much progress has happened. Amazing, thank you. Well, that concludes today's um, panel discussions. Um, thank you to, to all of you. I think the, the key things that you know, I've really taken away is starting to think about it's one in six employees like that has absolutely stuck in my mind. Let's think about how we can take a holistic, a holistic approach to this individuality and creating that safe space for those human connections, particularly leadership is so important. Um, and that step back of I'm going to take it away, Stacey, but that blank sheet of paper in terms of how we're thinking about kind of designing our workplaces and, and kind of pushing that culture forward to make it more inclusive. Um, thanks so much for your engagement again. I'm going to hand back to the wonderful Layla Mackenzie Dellis to summarise and close the event for today.